represent cities and towns before the legislature, the administration, and state agencies. And so we will expect some conflicting views, I expect, this evening, although, or at least we'll move into that area. The Massachusetts miracle, Barbara, when did it die? When, when do we say the burial should have taken place? It died um, around midnight on July 15th of last year when the legislature went into an all-night session, voted to um, raid the state pension fund to create a phony balanced budget so Mike Dukakis could go to Atlanta. After that, there was no end to what they would do. And um, as they were denying what was at that time a problem, they created a full-blown fiscal crisis, which is what we're in the middle of right now. Mm -hmm. Sheila, do you think that the Dukakis administration deceived the Massachusetts taxpayer by making it look like we were living in this wonderful hunky-dory ec economic sort of wonderful time? I don't know. I don't know whether he did or did not. What I do know is because cities and towns are tied so closely to the state and the state's fiscal health that what has happened to the state is devastating every city and town in Massachusetts and that's really the concern that I have. The issues that are being played out now will affect in your community, Barbara's community, all of the communities across the state the poor, the elderly, children in schools, every single one of the services that uh, each individual depends on. So what should we do? Raise taxes? Well, that's uh, one of the things that disturbs me so much is that the tax issue is casting a cloud over the real discussion here. All of us agree, Barbara had mentioned it earlier, the House version of the state budget, the governor's version of the state budget, both contain for fiscal year 90 without a single new tax between 500 and 700 million dollars in new revenues. Those dollars, for openers, those dollars must be shared with cities and towns and they are not now being shared. So that's really the first so place to begin So what do you think of that? I mean, you know, what does this well, say? Well, you know, the just, you know, when we talk about devastation, we've all heard about devastation before. Our opinion is, and our data shows, that the cities and towns can live with the level funding in the house budget because they have been getting a lot of local aid over the years and um, they've had surpluses and they have spent their surpluses but the fact is I think there's a little fat almost everywhere that could be cut in this year but um, I think to go any further if the Senate comes in and cuts local aid further now that we have been through our town meetings and the communities and city councils are working on the budgets that would be irresponsible and at that point even though we're supporting Chairman Volk in the House now with level funding at that point we will support the Mass Municipal Association if they try to cut local aid further because I think just technically that's irresponsible in May to do something like that. I appreciate what Barbara is saying, and I really value it. But there's a misreading here, which unfortunately many people share. The House budget is not level funded in local aid. It is $66 million less, not compared to what the governor proposed, but compared to what was distributed to cities and towns in fiscal 89. That means that those programs which are being impacted at the local level, in some cases, by 25% increases in health care costs, 53% increases in solid waste costs, those very programs are going to be underfunded next year if this budget exactly. goes through. Yes. And, and, but the problem is, you see, and the reason this happened is last summer when this happened, when we went into this fiscal crisis, the governor also took $91 million from the cities and towns mm -hmm. in what was the lottery surplus, so-called, went into the local aid accounts and took $91 million. At that point, we were out there screaming about it, saying he, he has no right to take this money from the cities and towns. Jack Flood was complaining about it. The Republicans were fighting about it. And the Mass Municipal Association, and Sheila wasn't there at the time, so this was not her fault, mm -hmm. really didn't do anything. Some of the mayors said, that's okay, we understand the governor needs the money for his presidential campaign. Well, Sheila, what, what do you no, say to no. that? No, no, I so was not the there. the governor needs the no. money. No, folks, I was not there. Barbara is right about that. And I but if therefore you were there, wouldn't you have screamed? I therefore can't undertake responsibility for it, but I do know some of the things that happened. The reason that the governor came back in and took those dollars, uh, dollar for dollar, out of the local aid account was because the Mass Municipal Association had mounted a successful campaign to prevent the administration from taking those dollars out of a lottery fund. We won one and we lost one. Mm -hmm. It is not yeah, that we are not there lost, doing it. When you lost, you didn't fight back. And the, the message they sent up when they didn't fight back was, was A, we don't need the money, and B, we're easy. And when that happened, when we were out there trying to get the 91 million back, immediately trying to call them back into, into session to override the governor's veto, when MMA didn't say anything, they weren't even at the press conference when this happened, the message went out that they weren't serious about the, the money because if I thought devastation was going to be the result of someone taking an equivalent $91 million from me, I would have complained about it loud and long. The fact that they didn't 
sent a message to Beacon Hill, and I knew at that point the local aid would be level funded this year. So it was we a serious mm -hmm. error on the part of the mayors, particularly, in not fighting back. You can always argue about how much a response was made and whether that response was mm -hmm. effective, because, Barbara, you are measuring it by effectiveness. Well, don't there you think we should scream? I mean, when, when you find that this is going to be the impact later on, I think more people probably should have been screaming. To tax or not to tax? That is our question. Some answers are coming up in just a minute. At issue, what can be done to salvage the mass miracle? My guests are Barbara Anderson, Executive Director of the Citizens for Limited Taxation, and Sheila Chimetz, who's the Executive Director of the Mass Municipal Association. Sheila, I guess the question goes in your court now. Don't you think that cities and towns are just too entirely dependent on the state? Absolutely. But the reason for their dependence is one that also prevents them from cutting loose. You're probably aware that Massachusetts, the state, has reserved uh, for 200 years solely to itself the right to raise all kinds of taxes. The only one that it delegated to cities and towns was the property tax, and CLT, with Barbara at its head, put a cap on the property tax. That left them no recourse except to turn to the state for help, which so they did in 1980. We are looking for a four-pronged program. We want the state to continue sharing its revenues with cities and towns. We want to have um, local option taxes that will broaden the base of revenue for cities and towns. And the one that we are proposing this year is uh, a local option real estate transfer tax because it will benefit okay, the almost every Okay, the land and transfer what does that tax. Mean? Exactly. It would allow um, the sale of property in the community to benefit up to 2% of the overall price of the property to benefit the community, which made that property a value by providing services uh, to I the see, uh, Barbara. That's uh, not, home well, that's or not business. Going, that's not going to happen simply because the legislature, or at least the House, has just used that vehicle in order to fund the county jails. So um, by taking the, the land transfer, the, these excise tax. Um, and earmarking for the county jail, which is something I think if we have to have a new tax, that's the thing we all agree it should be spent on because we don't want the prisoners roaming the streets. That has effectively killed that piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. All right, it now when... deflected it, not necessarily. And, and unless the Senate doesn't act on it, of course, yes. you don't know. Okay, okay. but you, that, that's times. something that you wouldn't have a big problem with? Oh, the we land transfer tax? We, we've been fighting the land transfer tax for years. That's one of the reasons we didn't mind seeing the, the deeds excise for the, the jails, mm -hmm. um, to the sense that we've got opposed because at least we know that some money is going to something that we all all agree with. But I mean, I agree with Sheila on the local aid. I think there should be a consistent um, local aid increase every year. It's just this year. They don't have the money. Shame on them, but they don't. Okay. And, what uh, are the steps, though? I mean, what happened? Why don't they have the money? Oh, because the, the state has spent 70% over the last six years, and inflation is only 25%, and the state spent us into a fiscal crisis with no control over what it was doing. But didn't we see this coming? I mean, didn't we yes. see this coming all along? Weren't yes. there groups just crying yes. and yes. screaming? Yes. there were. So and why was it such a runaway carriage? The Municipal Association and all of its municipal members, three years ago, spent an enormous amount of time and effort trying to get the state to take what was a portion then of a huge surplus and put it into what was called a rainy day fund so that when, as all of us knew, those massive revenues declined or decreased, mm -hmm. there would be dollars to send to cities and towns for absolutely critical local aid that would smooth out those declines. So if you rate this administration and you gave them a report card, what would you give them for their performance? It was not the administration alone. The administration supported our initiative in this area. It mm -hmm. was the legislature that would not, in fact, go along with doing this. Okay, so do we so give a grade? The legislature gets a grade? I give no grades. No grades? No. On but management, the administration definitely enough. Um, <laughs> and, the, and the legislature also did not do a good job on this. Okay, so let's look at Prop 2 and a half. We're going to have just a few moments mm. to examine what's happening. Cities and towns are faced with a lot of cuts and the override. What do you propose? We propose two things. One is changes in legislation that will allow municipalities to spend their money more effectively. I'll give you only one example. Something called double dipping. Every city and town is required to provide health care coverage for every municipal employee, whether or not that employee already has full health care coverage from a spouse or other family mm -hmm. member. That's nuts. There are hundreds of thousands of dollars okay, to so, be saved and by we'll changing that. that. So you support that, but let's get to the point of Prop 2 and a half. Now you is, propose that it should be done the... We are proposing uh, an increased flexibility in Proposition 2 and a half by allowing local legislative bodies, which would be town meetings or city councils, to exempt bonded indebtedness by a two-thirds vote. Okay, so Same two-thirds by which the they can council. vote a bond. Yes. You know, I don't understand what the problem is. If a community needs more money, you go to your voters and you ask. And the voters with the majority vote can give you more money. You want to exclude debt? Fine. 
ask the voters with a bond exclusion override, and the voters roughly half the time will say yes and half the time will say no. I don't understand why you have to send it to town meeting, which caused this problem in the first place why? by by pushing our property taxes up to 80 percent above the national average. No, you exclude not. anything it's from Prop two and a half. Two and a half is dead. So this bill will kill two and a half. We're going to fight this bill, and if it does pass, mm -hmm. we're going to put it back on the ballot to get it repealed. Jeannie, I have to point out, and I think Barbara will admit that each of the half a dozen, or most of the half a dozen times that two and a half has already been changed since its adoption in November of 1980, they have said CLT has said that this will kill two and a half. We're not interested that in killing two and a half. That is We have supported all the legislation, including MMA's legislation, on accruing the, the dollar amount they can, they can raise. We supported it all except for the removal of the two-thirds for extraordinary overrides. We and we did not, not at that point say it would kill two and a half. We have never done that, Sheila, and that isn't fair. But we are saying that the changes have been made, the responsible changes have been made. Now it's a simple majority vote to override. If your towns need more money, then let your towns go out and talk to the voters or as intelligent and informed certainly as the legislature is, and they can make the decision on this. And if you don't want to do that, then take the change in two and a half that you propose to the ballot and let the same voters who created Proposition two and a half change it if they want. And we would not oppose that as long as the voters made the decision. Barbara knows that I opposed two and a half in the beginning, as did the Municipal Association, and crisscrossed the state uh, debating against it. We have seen, however, and, and she knows this as well, <clears throat> the value of two and a half in protecting the property tax, which is a very vulnerable tax. Mm -hmm. We are not intent on destroying it. We are intent on building in a little more flexibility for cities and towns that have very few avenues of recourse. If you okay. exclude debt, then everyone's going to want to exclude everything <coughs> else. Now we'll just be opening the door to total exclusions. Plus you're going to encourage bonding and they're simply going to go into debt and then they're really going to have a problem. That's going to be big trouble. Unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to end on that note. Special thanks to Barbara Anderson and Sheila Chimitz for helping us to look at the issues on the state level. And now our focus is going to be redirected to cities and towns and the override just ahead.